morning and happy Jazz Fest. Welcome to another live WDCB broadcast from Piano Forte, 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. I'm Barry Winograd, and in just a moment, we'll bring you an interview in live yesterday at the Chicago Jazz Festival. Today, he's with us solo here in the intimate and acoustically pristine studio space at Piano Forte. WDCB brings you this special broadcast in cooperation with the Piano Forte Foundation, whose mission is to preserve and promote piano culture in Chicago and beyond. More information at pianofortefoundation.org. WDCB's Jazz Fest Week broadcasts are made possible in part by North Coast Brewing Company, at Ed Emotic Research, and Steve Maxwell Vintage and Custom Drums. And now, let's welcome to the Piano Forte stage, Mr. Ryan Cohn. <laughs> All right, good morning, Ryan. Good morning, and, uh, Barry. Good to see you. It was great, great to hear you. yesterday afternoon. And, Thank you. Uh, first of all, welcome back to Chicago. Thank you. Yes, it's always good to have you here. And uh, let's just uh, start with yesterday's performance in the Von Freeman uh, Pavilion mm -hmm. with uh, Joe Locke and uh, Lauren Cohn and uh, George Flutus. Yep. What a wonderful quartet and what a wonderful time. And uh, do you guys... Uh... Mm -hmm. um, I played with Joe a fair amount over the last, oh, I'd say seven years now, um, on and off in different projects. And a lot of the music we played yesterday actually was from a record that we recorded that was released in 2010 that Joe was on, a record of mine called Another Look. So, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the year, over the years, uh, you know, I've been playing with him in different contexts in my groups. And also I've been fortunate to play with, uh, with his group in a variety of projects. Mm -hmm. And Lauren Cohen, the bassist I've been playing with for years, who now lives in New York, um, who um, also has been playing in Joe's Quartet the last couple of years. So the three of us have played a little bit. And that was the first time uh, George Flutus has played in the group. But I played with George on and off, and he knew the music. So it was a very, very comfortable and simpatico uh, group the you know the four of us and you know that rhythm section in particular is oh yeah and let's let's me. not forget ryan's uh, excuse me lauren's recent release home yeah which all of you are on as yeah well. it's a great record um george uh, uh donald edwards plays drums on that right um but yeah you know so we, there was another context with joe and lauren and mm -hmm. uh, lauren you know it was a at least a really nice record. Yeah. So Joe Locke, who's uh, not only a great vibraphone uh, marimbist mallet man, but also looked like a very excellent dancer last night. Yeah, he got to show <laughs> off some of his dance moves. Very, very impressive. Uh, how did you guys uh, hook up? How did you first uh, run into Joe Locke? Uh, actually, the first time we ever connected, we were both on a record label called Scirocco Jazz mm -hmm. um, in the early 2000s. I, I released a record in 2001 on Scirocco called here and now. And Joe was one of the main artists on this label. It was a UK-based label. And the president of the label gave Joe a copy of the Here and Now record. And he just checked it out, and he, and he dug it, and he just called me one day to say he dug it. And that, that really meant the world to me, because Joe was an artist I admired. And you know, we just sort of kept in touch. And then a project came up in 2008 where he was worth, working with a symphony orchestra. And he asked me to come and play in the group with a quartet plus the orchestra. And that project ended up, uh, there were a few performances with that over the next couple of years, and it ended up turning into a record that I wrote orchestral arrangements for. Hmm. And so that's where it started with his group. And then I played and recorded with his quartet. And then uh, he recorded with me on another look. So it started, though, in 2008 when we uh, did that orchestral record. Well, do you think we could hear a, a couple of songs uh, without the orchestra, without sure. the show, just uh, Ryan at the piano? Absolutely. Okay. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ryan Cohn, and we are live from Piano Forte, 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. You're listening to WDCB 90.9 FM and WDCB.org.
big influence on my playing, uh, something that he wrote for the Baroness Pananica, who was a patron of the arts in the, in the 40s and 50s, and, and particularly a patron to, to Monk, and he wrote that for her. And um, I'd like to play for you now a piece by uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim, and this is O Grande Amor.
Brian Cohn, live from Piano Forte on WDCB, 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. We heard uh, Pananica, O Grande Amor, and uh, Ryan, uh, boy, wonderful. Just thank wonderful. you, thank you very much. So you mentioned, uh, you can pull yourself up okay. a little bit closer there. There you go. Don't be afraid, they don't bite. All right. All right. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim and Thelonious Monk mm -hmm. both interesting uh, different disparate influences on your, yeah. I assume your writing as well as your Yeah, playing. absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, I never really thought of it together like that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting just, you know, the idea of thinking about those things, those two artists together. And I think they really complement each other. Um, mm -hmm. In the fact that Monk, Monk's had such a big influence on me um, from his composing and his playing and just his swing and his the depth of of groove and swing in his in his writing and in his playing and the sense of purpose in his uh his uh, improvisations too which is you know he's uh for you know known for sort of very idiosyncratic way of playing and mm -hmm. writing and i think people that aren't really familiar with his music see it only that part of his you know what he, what he does but in fact, all his rhythms and his melodies, and often they're in very uh, displaced uh, parts of the beats or, or melodies that seem really odd, they all are really fit the composition always. When he improvises, he's, his improvisations fit the compositions. And um, just all, all of his artistry has really affected me. And when I think of uh, Joe Beam, I think of just his melodic, beautiful melodic sense and real lush harmonies, but particularly the lyricism of his, mm. of his uh, melodies. And um, I think they, they complement each other well, you know, bringing those two different elements of those strong idiosyncratic rhythms from Monk and then just these different melodic shapes from, uh, from Joe Beam. Um, well, it seems as if they, as a great composer will do when you're writing tunes, are representing are reflecting their uh, cultures, where they mm -hmm. grew up, Monk in New York. Yeah. And uh, going through that whole scene and uh, where he grew up was uh, probably a little rougher than where Jobim yeah, grew up sure. on the uh, beach in Brazil, so to speak. And uh, their music really reflects, paints pictures of uh, what their Absolutely. social backgrounds Absolutely. were. Now, you as a writer, uh, you uh, receive commissions, which is something I think we should explain to our audience what that's all about. It's not, you know, we don't call you the commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to receive a commission is quite an honor. And uh, then to actually get new commissions, as you have uh, recently from the Chamber of Music Ensemble? Chamber of Music America. America? Yeah, an organization uh, in New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's quite an honor. How did mm -hmm. you uh, get, uh, well, First of all, when did you first start writing for the larger ensembles that do uh, usually give out these commissions? Um, over the years, I've always sort of, you know, uh, worked uh, with my, my sextet, and, and I also had an opportunity to write for strings early on a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I always had these sort of small sort of chamber group sensibilities or interests. And just from, to start out, it really was just write, like I just was writing music all the time. I wasn't really thinking about, am I gonna, you know, how am I gonna- Is it like, solo get, piano or is it full symphony not even, but right. even, But even just like, how am I gonna get hired or is it gonna <laughs> oh, be a commission? Right, yeah. It was just like the impulse, just the joy of writing music all the time and my interest in just writing for these ensembles. And I did it a lot, you know, in, when I was in school over 20 years ago and right out of school, I was just writing music all the time. and. And then I was recording. So by doing so, um, that's how you start to gain interest in what you're, what you're doing, as opposed to waiting for something, like an opportunity to write for something and then write for it. Like mm -hmm. it was really just record, uh, writing and recording a lot of music. Um, and then at the time, you know, also there were opportunities to try to get grants or commissions that you would apply for. And by the fact that you had recorded music that you, I was just doing myself, it sort of allows you to be heard and have your music be heard. And then you get one thing, and then that can lead to the next, and, mm. and so on. Well, I've always been under the impression there are literally thousands of uh, composers and writers and mm -hmm. arrangers in this country who are mm -hmm. young and very good, or, well, not necessarily young. They're of all ages and very good. And uh, how difficult is it when you're uh, applying for a grant or a commission? And, you know, is that something that's uh, nerve-wracking? Is it hard to do? Or is it I, 
when I got involved doing that, I didn't, I didn't come, come at it from an academic standpoint where okay. I really understood like the sort of history of grants. Uh -huh. It was for me, it was like I, I had music that I had written and I already was thinking about the next thing I wanted to compose. Oh, okay. And I saw, all right, well, this is here's a chance to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of ignorant like of just the, the politics that are involved with it or even the difficulties of it. It was just, I was driven by the fact that I just, I loved the music and I wanted, I was looking for avenues to have uh, opportunity to fund the next project or to get it heard even. It wasn't even about the money, it was, it was just a, a platform or a vehicle to get the music out or heard. Mm -hmm. Now this newest commission from Chamber Music America, America. Mm -hmm. uh, do they say to you, uh, hey, we have this type of instrumentation, we'd like you to just write a piece, or do they say to you, hey, this, uh, we'd like you to write a piece uh, concerning uh, this event or that event, or how does that go about? Um, that particular uh, organization and that, that grant, is, it's pretty open, which is mm -hmm. very cool about it. Like, you basically propose what you would like to do. Um, I had an idea for a larger like a really a lar much larger ensemble than I had done with my own music, originally 15 pieces. Uh, that particular grant, you can go up to 10 pieces. So I modified my idea to incorporate my jazz sextet, which I've recorded with for years, which has rhythm section and um, two horns, two woodwinds and a trumpet. And then I added a string quartet to it. Mm -hmm. So you can go up to 10 pieces for that particular grant and um, so you tell them what you would like to do. You propose an idea. All right. Yeah. Well, how about I propose an idea of hearing some original Ryan Cohen at the piano? Oh, Can right. we do that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. This is Ryan Cohen, the pianist, composer. We're at 90.9 .9 FM, WDCB, and live from Piano Forte, 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. Thank you. 
Ryan Cohn. Live from Piano Forte, 1335 South Michigan Avenue. If you're listening to WDCB, 90.9 FM, WDCB.org. I'm Barry Winograd. And Ryan, those two wonderful uh, songs, and I was glad to hear something in three this morning. <laughs> what were they called? Uh, the first one was a tune of mine. It's one of the first tunes that I ever composed, actually. I wrote it for my grandfather. Um, I think when I was about 18 or 19, I called it simply Song for My Grandfather. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece was a piece by the great pianist Donald Brown called Waltz for Monk. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right. Donald Brown, wow. I'm uh, impressed that you knew about him. But that takes oh, yeah. me to uh, one of my questions. Yesterday we heard you with a, a great quartet. And Donald Brown, of course, was part of Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers, mm -hmm. which was one of the last bands really to be on the road a lot. Mm -hmm. And... Is that something you would like to do, be able to develop a quartet, go out, you know, uh, 48 of the 52 weeks of the year, and then uh, hang out in New York the other four weeks with everybody, <laughs> and then get back out? And would that make a uh, difference to the uh, development of you as a musician and also, of course, your compositions? Absolutely. Uh, I think the only way to really learn this music... I mean, to develop a band, for one thing, the only way to really develop a band is to be out playing as much as possible. And, um, you know, between the times of, uh, like, you know, like uh, the mid-2000s up until, you know, maybe a few years ago, I was doing that a lot, actually, like, just going out and focusing on just my quartet and trying to go out and play as much as possible. Uh, wherever, I, wherever I could, you know, we, we would tour, um, you know, regionally. We did a little bit of stuff on the coast, and we had the opportunity to go on some international tours as well. But really, that's the only way to develop a group and a group dynamic is to be playing all the time um, because that's the difference of composing for jazz versus really any other type of writing or for any other formats is that you want the, the writing to be a platform like a starting base but if you're really writing for the group you want them to you want to write for those individual players to get inside the music and for the music to be different every night and that only happens when you're playing it all the time and I've seen that, like I had done some um, State Department tours years ago where we were on the road for five weeks and we're literally playing, you know, two, three times a day. And then by the end of um, that period, like what happens when you just get together play is, is it's just a conversation where everybody's completely fluid and the music is, uh, wh however complex or simple the music is, it's all about just interpreting it together. It's about the group dynamic. And that happens from playing all the time. There's really no substitute for it. And that's one of the great changes we've experienced in our lifetime in jazz, going from a band that's together for, like if you're on Duke Ellington's band for 50 years or whatever, yeah. to where you're with Blakey for, let's say, four or five years or longer, to today where, you know, last night we heard uh, yourself with Joe Locke and... Uh, Lauren uh, Cohn and George Flutus, and you know, there was a great dynamic of musicianship happening. But obviously, if you had that continuing on, you know, for the next uh, five months, six months on the yeah, road I mean, together, there's, there's, there's nothing like that. There'd it. be a wonderful growth. That's the first thing we feel like when we get off the stage. It was like, oh, you yeah. know, we should, right. let's keep going. You know, Cincinnati let's, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's do it again. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's always something new to find in the music. And another thing that people don't realize is not only the dynamic on the stage, but off the stage, too, really uh, lends itself to uh, the musical interpretations that the audience will hear. That definitely can help, you know, if you have a good or vibe together. Yeah, 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 if you don't get along. And there's, there's situations, though, too, where, like, where sometimes, you know, the musicians don't get along until they get on the stage. Mm -hmm. Like, but it's all about the music and the, the kinship for the music. Yeah. That, you know, that's, that's the focus. And yeah. then when you're off the stage, you know, it can go either uh, yeah, way. Well, but, yeah, there, but, but to your point, yeah, it is, uh, it's a big yeah. difference. And that was, that's what was great about this quartet I was playing with yesterday was just there's a real simpatico vibe with everybody personally, you know, like just sort of how we just get along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a you know a big part, and comes across I think in the concerts as well. Yeah. So as a composer, I know you write at the piano. Now, somewhat, yeah. Yeah. Oh, only somewhat. Well, I I, I have done a lot of that, but mm -hmm. one thing I've been thinking about as a composer over the years also is that it's important to try to write away from the piano, and mm -hmm. not necessarily see the writing from my uh, like instrumental perspective. 
because it, it gives you like one particular view. Mm -hmm. The piano is, is a good place to do that because of just the nature of the instrument. It has the widest it has range. Everything. It's, it's right. an orchestral instrument. Right. But there's some, and it's, it's a good thing. I've done it both ways because you can write sort of idiosyncratic, pianistic type things, which are very cool. But it's good. Um, I use this for a challenge for myself, and uh, I talk to students about this too, like to uh, write away from your instrument so that you can conceive the ideas. But yeah, I do uh, both. No, that, well, and I was going to ask you, if you ever had a revelation yesterday, uh, Robert Irving III here was with us, and he uh, let us know that sometimes he wakes up in the middle of the night, he's got these sounds in his head, huh. and he runs off to find a recording instrument, you know, and uh, sing the tunes that he's, or the sounds that he has into the instrument so he doesn't lose it, then he goes back to bed. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I've definitely been in similar situations where you wake up and it's like, oh, that's it. And you've got to go write that idea down and uh, see so hope it doesn't lose well, it. And that's not an old thing. I remember uh, Steve Allen used to carry a little recorder yeah. in his pocket. And this was way before the digital age. <laughs> it was a cassette recorder. But he, you could see him. He'd pull it out and he'd be talking to it. Or you could hear him humming a little melody or something. Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, typically, I think the best ideas come from when you're not practicing. When you're doing something else, like anything, driving, going somewhere, that's when your mind just isn't thinking about it and just something mm -hmm. can just happen that you wouldn't have if you're just, sometimes you have to bang it out, you have to work very hard on it. But uh, Well, and I've noticed in your composition, your inspiration, you know, family, your grandfather, mm -hmm. your tour of uh, mm -hmm. Africa, and other things have all come out in your writing. Is there uh, any particular song that was a real inspiration, was like, Boom, oh, look at that mountain, oh man, and you, you had a tune and that was that and it's become one of your favorites of your repertoire? Well, I think this tune I played actually, that was the first time I had an experience like mm -hmm. that where um, it was the mood and the feeling I had was so palpable that it was the first time I had that experience of sitting down to create something and the mood just was overpowering where it just it, it just laid itself out from beginning to end like I wrote that in 10 minutes for your and grandfather yeah I mean he had he had just passed away and I had a very very close relationship with him and I always I always used to practice the piano on Sundays um I mean I, that was one of the days and he'd come over <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> not just in, so, but he would come over on Sundays and um uh it was a Sunday and it was one of the first times like where he wasn't there and so it was like the mood was palpable. And I just sat down and just sort of put my hands on the keys and it just sort of wrote itself. And that was the first experience I had like that. And that really made me want to be a composer was just the connection of creating personally, you know, like, so I try to take for my writing. I mean, there's you, I, I've been hired to write things in different contexts and I love doing that. But, uh, our, you know, personally, I love I think it's important just to, to communicate, communicate something that's personal. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we get you to uh, communicate a couple of more? Sure. And uh, we're listening to Ryan Cohn here. We're at Piano Forte, 1335 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And I'd like to uh, remind you that if you were there yesterday, you heard a great concert, and we're hearing a great concert today as well. Ryan Cohn at the piano.
Ryan Cohn. Ryan Cohn. Yeah, we're getting up against it there. All right, tell me about that composition. I think I've heard it before. That's Duke Ellington's uh, Don't You Know I Care. Yeah. I love playing that tune. And uh, Don George uh, wrote the lyrics, I believe. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and uh, Joya Sherrill used to sing it. And There you go. Oh, I was sitting here smiling. And you know Billy Strayhorn's uh, 100th birthday is this yeah. month, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I've heard so much good uh, thoughts and sounds from you as a composer and arranger. We haven't even talked about your piano playing, so I just have one quick question. As a young man, obviously you were hearing other piano players as you were learning how to play. Was there one particular jazz pianist recording style that said to you, wow, you know, I love playing Tchaikovsky, but I think I want to play like uh, so-and-so? You know, that's changed. I, it's, uh -huh. It was in different periods there were, you know. I mm -hmm. think early on it was like Chick Corea, who mm -hmm. I still love. Oh, of course. I yeah. still love. And then my thing was I always kept going backwards. I was originally into <laughs> pop music and fusion. It led me into Chick, you know. Yeah. And then Chick led me to Bud Powell and McCoy Tyner. And, and then that led me back to, um, you know, like... Uh, well, I certainly um, heard some Oscar in Oscar that Oscar Peterson, song. absolutely. Yeah. Finest newborn. Um, and Duke Ellington's piano playing, which I, you know, I uh, started listening to maybe 10 years ago and just being blown away by that. Because everybody knows him as a composer, of course. Yeah, he was quite a pianist. He was yeah. an incredible piano player and an incredible sense of swing. So my taste kept, you know, like mm. moving around. I love the record Finest Newborns, A World of Piano. That's, that's been one of my important records. And, of course, Ahmad Jamal has been a huge influence mm -hmm. on me. Poinciana, of course. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, have you heard the uh, Ellington Strayhorn duos? Uh, um, they were done for RCA. I, yes. I, I'm not intimately familiar with it, but yes. Yeah, but I love the story behind those and... Uh, very quickly, it was they were in the studio, had some time to kill, put Ellington in one piano, Billy at the other, and they pl recorded it, but none of the bands around. Then they played it back for the band. They said, okay, who's who? And nobody could tell wow. who Duke or Billy wa wow. were. Yeah. And that's from the guys in the band. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. All right. Well, Ryan Cohn, uh, Ryan Cohn at C O H A N dot com. Is that where Thank folks you. can uh, get a hold yeah. of you? You can see what I'm up to uh, next. All right. and and we'll look forward to your next uh, recording uh, project. And uh, you have a tell it to, very quickly. You, you mentioned some very wonderful names. Uh, your sextet has uh, in personnel changed since you've uh, moved, right? Well, I, I'm still in Chicago, but I, I oh. play in New York frequently. And Seems like you're always. In New York, every, I, yeah. I hear that a lot, you know. Yeah. But I'm um, playing next week at Dizzy's uh, Club Coca Cola at Jazz Lincoln Center, and I'm using New York musicians while I'm there with Steve Wilson, Alex Sipiagi, and John Ellis, Lauren Cohen, and Donald Edwards. All right. Well, I'm, I won't wish you luck. I'll just say I'm sure it's going to be a great show and a great time. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, what day of the week, in case someone's in New York? Wednesday, September 16th. Okay. You've been listening to pianist Ryan Cohn, and thank you, Ryan Cohn, thank for being here. Thank you very much, Barry. And it's been a live broadcast from the Piano Forte Studios in Chicago. You can find out more about Ryan's music and future live appearances on the web at ryancohn.com. WDCB would like to thank Thomas Zolz, Victor Lejeune, and the Piano Forte Foundation for helping us bring to you all of these wonderful live broadcasts over the past week. Piano Forte's mission is to preserve and promote piano culture in Chicago and beyond. You can find out more about their upcoming events and programs at pianofortefoundation.org. Hey, if you're already out and about this morning, you can stop by the Jazz Record Mart, 27 East Illinois Street in Chicago, for live music from Ernest Dawkins, Frank Catalano, and others in their annual Sunday morning event sponsored by WDCB. And also, there's a free outdoor concert starting one hour from now, right around the corner from us here at Piano Forte, as the Kid Jordan Quartet plays from noon till 2 p.m. in Fred Anderson Park. That's at 16th and Wabash. And don't forget to join, stop by, and say hello to us at the Chicago Jazz Festival today in Millennium Park. The final day of the fest also gets underway at noon. WDCB's Jazz Fest Week special broadcasts are made possible by North Coast Brewing Company, Edomotic Research, and Steve Maxwell Vintage and Custom Drums. Thanks also to the team at WDCB who helped put together today's event, including Ken Scott, Dan Bindert, Bill Tennant, and Clarice Kavoris. As thanks especially to Mr. Ryan Cohn for sharing his music with us today, and thank you for listening.
I'm Barry Winograd, and now let's send it back to the studio where Leslie Carros is ready to bring us more on DCB Jazz.